All right, Eel Nerds, we are on to episode 91, and I have come very well prepared for this episode because I have consulted a lot of experts, and I'm going to show you their recommendations, and you're going to watch today guaranteed foolproof predictions for the rest of 2023 based on several experts, and I will walk you through it. Uh, let's get started. We have 213 subscribers. Thank you again. And if you're new and you are not that familiar with fixed income, hey, I was one of you at some point. Consider looking at the playlist called the Income Investing Roadmap. It walks you through the show from the basics of fixed in income investing all the way to today, episode 91. And remember to not just take my word for anything. Do your own research. Speaking of doing your own research, I want to declare again that I do not have a conflict of interest. I learn. I share my learnings. I am not a wealth management advisor. I do not have an agenda. I couldn't care less if you do what I say or not. As a matter of fact, I would love for you to disagree and share your thoughts in the comments section. Wonderful. So let's look at how we go about unearthing the guaranteed foolproof predictions. A quick recap of what we are going to do. We're going to do a road thus far kind of review of where we are look at the immediate road ahead and then we're going to look at predictions from experts and i enjoyed gathering these predictions and then what i'm going to do based on those expert predictions and my own reading of course well first things first you know we're looking for demand destruction but that appears to not be happening the american consumer is strong very strong and spending has not gone down except in a couple of small areas. And the job market is bulletproof. And we are at an all-time low for unemployment. There are small signals here and there of fewer job postings and that sort of stuff. But when it comes to employment, we are at an incredible high. And earnings, you know, this is earnings season. I look at that with reasonable attention and say, hey, how many companies are beating estimates, not beating estimates? And you know, companies that are that are announcing their earnings are indeed beating estimates, which is pretty wild. And so there is really no earnings recession as well, which is pretty awesome. But all of this means one thing. If the Fed is not able to break the market in one of three ways, then either we're going to look for this magical transformation where there is no recession and yet inflation comes down or inflation is going to keep going up. Those are the only two choices. Uh, speaking of inflation only going up, if you looked at the past 75 odd year history that we have captured inflation, there have only been two periods in time that inflation has gone down. One is during the great financial crisis, 2008, and the other during COVID when the world shut down clueless. Outside of those two times, Inflation has always been there. It just is a matter of by how much are prices inflating. And so we start with 100, which is a benchmark in 1983. We are up to 306. And outside of those two little blips, costs, CPI has been going up by 3%, 4%, sometimes 7%, and so on. Uh, you know, what are we looking at when we look immediately ahead? A couple of quick things. You know, uncertainty, unfortunately, is the norm. We have this cycle of demand not being destructed, job market at the full employment, and the earnings are still pouring in. And the result of that, unfortunately, in the short term means inflation above the benchmark of 2% because one of these three needs to break. A couple of things going on in the back uh, to kind of create uncertainty or a greater uncertainty. We have lived with the Ukraine war for a year. It doesn't show any signs of ending. We also have a lot of dysfunction in the Congress, and that doesn't show any signs of ending either. And the Middle East is a new turmoil that has begun, and if anything, there may be possibilities that it escalates. So all of these are ominous signs, and speaking of ominous, I hope we do not talk about Taiwan anytime soon. The sum total of all of this, the odds of interest rates increasing because we cannot tame these three forces is certainly there. The odds of interest rates kind of hitting a crash landing 
because some of these other forces pulling the country's attention away is also there. So that is the counterbalance we live in, very scary times. And so what would you expect in scary times? In scary times, you would expect the market to do what is called a flight to quality, meaning they would say, I'm going to go grab onto the 10-year treasury and buy as much of it as possible. And when a lot of people want to buy something and the supply is the same, then the price of the 10-year treasury should go up. When the price of a bond goes up, the yield goes down. So we should expect the 10-year treasury to go down, except the opposite is happening there as well. So treasury yields are actually going up because people are not buying 10-year treasuries. And this is saying that the market is shunning fixed income, which should really say the market is shunning longer duration fixed income because that is considered the safe haven. I'm going to grab and lock in my yields. And the reason is because they expect even more inflation and perhaps even more rate increases. And so the market, instead of going towards what would be considered a safe haven, it is running away from it. And when your backbone is not strong, you got problems. Uh, speaking of which, the 10-year rate right now is 4.93%. Think about it. That used to be 2%. And so we are at 2.5 times more yield than what is norm. And that is absolutely unbelievable. And the two-year is at a crazy high of 5.24%. It's actually even higher than that today. And so what this is telling us is even what was considered a safe haven is not a safe haven. There is so much uncertainty in the market. So what are you going to do? And so I thought, okay, I need to see this for myself. I'm going to do a very, very simple test. I'm going to go look at the universe of publicly traded companies. And there are 7108 publicly traded companies. And this tell me equities that are US based that have reasonable trading volume. And they got to make more than 5% in margin. Now, why do I say they need to make more than 5% in margin? If your profit margin is less than 5%, even a small change in your costs, you know, you, you need to give raises to your employees or your gas prices went up or your electricity prices went up, even small changes would throw you for a loop. And so why don't you take a guess? We start from 7,100. How many companies that trade at a reasonable volume do you think have more than 5% net profit margin well surprise surprise only 21 companies 21 percent of companies qualify almost 80 percent of the companies are making a profit of either five percent or less than five percent which means you add one more shock to the system profitable companies are going to go to unprofitable you think through what that means and then i thought okay if 20 percent of the companies are you know having a healthy profit and 80 percent of them are barely scraping through what percent are in rock solid status and let me define rock solid again i'm only using domestic companies and you do you i do not have in today's market i do not have the chutzpah to go buy stock in other countries i'm sticking domestic so if you pick domestic stocks and if you pick high volume and then I said, well, I want the highest profit margin possible. I want a huge profit margin. So small shocks are not going to rattle them. And oh, by the way, I want them to have very little debt below average debt. The average debt is 35 something percent. I want these companies to have less than 40 percent debt to equity. And well, while I'm at it, I also would like for them to have huge amounts of cash flow. These are the companies that cannot be rattled easily because they don't have a lot of debt. So interest hikes will not bother them. They are making a ton of profit and they also have cash flow that they can you know, use to do one thing versus the other. Now make a guess what percent of the companies qualify. Hint, hint, it's a number less than 21% because only 21% uh, qualify in this bracket above 5% net profit. Hold on to your horses. The actual answer is a stunningly low number. Only 0.1%. One out of a thousand companies are rock solid. And you are telling me you want to go buy equities? 
good luck with that. So now let's say, uh, you know, maybe we're all wrong. What do I know? I'm a newbie to investing. So I thought I'd go to experts because those experts, they are really good. So let's look at what experts say. Expert opinion number one, drum roll. Wall Street's biggest bear, Mike Wilson, says an end of the year stock rally is actually likely. And they go, whoa, you know, I don't know what I'm talking about. Mike Wilson is allegedly a big bear. And even the big bear says a stock market rally is coming. And so I read the article and here is what it says. So U.S. stocks could enjoy a year-end rally, but he still believes the year-end will be lower than they are right now. So I want to make sure I understand this. Stocks are going to go up, but then they are really going to come down. This way, Mr. Wilson, full respect, is right whether they go up or they go down. Either that or the person who wrote this article is not really good at summarizing what Mr. Wilson believes. I did not get a lot out of that expert opinion. Hopefully you did. So I thought I would look for more experts. And this time I looked for a really good one. The one that I looked at is BlackRock. BlackRock tweaks Treasury's view after a sharp run up in yields. And I go, whoa, this sounds like a game changing advice. Let me read that article. We are tactically neutral and strategically underweight. And I go, whoa, whoa, one more time again. Tactically neutral and strategically underweight. And I go, so what do you want me to do? Apparently, you need to be strategically underweight while being tactically neutral. If you figure that out, you let me know. The best expert that I thought in this situation is Mr. Bohr, scientist Bohr, who said prediction is very difficult, especially if it is about the future. Nice job, Niels. If the future is really hard to see, I figure at least we can look at our past. That's set in stone. Treasury bond buyers are increasingly households. How about that? 73% of treasury purchases in the last year have come from people like you and me. And that is really what is driving treasury demand. And I'm happy to be part of that particular buying group, even though we hold much less power than the institutions do. And so having informed myself with all of these expert opinions, here is my strategy. And I'm gonna hire experts like this to say, well, which store do I turn next? I am keeping my duration very, very low, um, about 60-ish percent, 65 percent of my uh, fixed income matures within a year, and I am increasing duration. Let me explain what that means. In my opinion, if I can put away money for a longer duration, and I don't need it right away because I am not a day trader for anything, stocks or bonds. If I can put away money for a longer duration and earn a higher interest, I would take the chance. The two year is my jam. We get about 5.3, 5.4% state tax free, which in Illinois would add to about 5.8%. I am sold, I am buying more two years and very slowly the zero to 90 and the one to three year bar will get flipped for me. I'm gonna have more in one to three years and less than zero to 90 days. And that doesn't mean that I'm stuck. I will hold it to maturity. Then the question is, what is my cost of being wrong? Let's say that a huge bull market starts day after tomorrow. Yeah, not happening. You know why? Because of the data I showed you earlier, because only 0.1% of the companies are going to weather the storm. If there is a storm, and all likelihood is that there is gonna be a storm. And so I don't expect a bull market, you do you. If the market does crash, I'll just sell some of my really short duration T-bills. And as you know, if you buy a T-bill at 99.5 cents every day, it starts a march towards that 100 cents. And so you can always sell it at a profit. If it is a short duration, you will be able to sell it at a profit. So that's what I would do. I'm gonna still keep that healthy mix in the zero to six months. And if there is a market crash, I will sell my zero to six months at a profit and then use that to buy equities. In the meanwhile, I am happy to sit back and earn 5.5%. And if my two years that I am accumulating, if they drop in price because it is an interest rate increase, I'm just gonna ho hum it and wait for the whole two years. I can certainly go two years without selling my treasuries. You do you.
My expert prediction is to T-bill and chill, but indeed increase duration to two years. That is me. Would love to hear from you. Thank you.